welcome every single location around the world. It is so good to be joining you. If I've never met you before, my name's Dave, me and my wife Saz, we have the privilege of being the pastors of Freedom Church Charleston. South Carolina, USA. Come on. We are loving it. We moved over to the States a little over nine months ago to start planting our church with our incredible team. Shout out to you guys in the USA. Shout out to the team that are here in the UK coming to join us in the next couple of months. We are loving it. We are loving the journey of church planting. We're loving living um, in an overseas setting for us. It's just such an adventure. Uh, it's such an adventure. Saz is preaching next week, and you can see that you can see the tan comparison because it is not fair. We are living in the same place. But you know what? Enough about that because today I've got the privilege of wrapping up the uncontainable series for us. And if this is your very first time in freedom, or maybe you've been away for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the fact that we believe God has called us to be an expressive and passionate people. We believe that every single one of us is wired for this thing we call worship. And if you're new to church, that might sound strange, but actually it's not strange at all. It's the fact that every single one of us has passions, has things that we give our life and our priorities and our focuses to. But we believe that ultimately we're called to give that to God first. And we're going to dig into that a little bit more. But let me ask you a question today. If I could get three or four or five of your closest friends, family, colleagues, people you go to school or college with together, and I gave them three words to describe you, what are the three words you hope that they might say? You know, anybody willing to be honest enough with me and join me in being honest here that probably the answers coming to mind straight away are a little vain, you know, good looking. Tall, thanks babe, tall, they're never going to say that to me, you know. Tall, dark, and handsome. I've been wanting that for all these years, but it's never happened yet. But, or maybe the things that you'd be looking for people to say, they're actually about the, the attributes about how you live life or how you work. Maybe they, you want them to say reliable, consistent, disciplined. Maybe you want them to say things like generous, kind, thoughtful. Maybe, honestly, what you're actually sitting there and saying is, I, can't, I don't know. I don't know what they would say. I know what I hope they wouldn't say. So let's flip the question. What are the three words you hope they wouldn't say? What are the things that would cut deep if people said, well, Dave, he's short. Well, no, no, let's not go there. What about ill-discipline? What about unreliable? What about selfish these things? There's, it would hurt, wouldn't it, right? So I'm going to call three or four people up to say, no, I'm not going to do that now. But the reality is the words that we use to describe ourselves and the words that we describe things with, they're, they're very powerful, aren't they? They're powerful because they've got two different things. Because when I think about the words that come to mind for me, often they're not necessarily the words that I think describe me here in this moment, but they're often the things that I want to become. You see, there's this combination of the way that we describe ourselves. It's descriptive, but it's also aspirational. There's something about the words we use to describe ourselves. They, they tell us something about who we are in this moment, but they also, in the words that were just coming to mind, they tell us something about who we want to become. And I've got a word today that I want us to dig into. And I'm interested to see whether this word would have featured in your three things you want to be said about you or the three things you don't want to be said about you. And it's the word contagious. Oh, now I don't know about you, but sometimes like, oh, Dave, he's really contagious. I, mean, I haven't got a rash or anything, you know. But would the word contagious define you and I? Would it be something that would mark your life? Now, you know, it's interesting because all around the world, our lives were touched in the last couple of years by the COVID pandemic. And honestly, we have spent years trying to be anything but contagious, right? Yeah, we became experts in being uncontagious, right? We all know how to sanitize and how to stay distant, all that kind of thing. And so the word contagious is about contagious. Oh, I don't really, no, I don't fancy that one. You know, like, oh yeah, you really got to meet my friend. Well, contagious. With what? But, you know, even as a society now, there's, you know, there's also this kind of like vibe that people don't, you don't want to share stuff. You stay in your lane. You stay in your bubble. You do you. I'll do me. As long as we don't talk about it, we're good. But actually, there's something about being a Christian that calls us to be intentionally contagious. Because here's the thing. You and I are contagious, whether you like it or not. 
The question is, is what you have worth catching? And as we wrap up this uncontainable series, we're going to talk about being contagious. Because we actually have written it into the wildfire DNA. If you're new to Freedom Church, we've got these 12 attributes that define the character of our church. We believe that these are things that we all should be aspiring to chase after. There's something of the who within the what of what we do as a church. And I don't know if you've ever noticed it before, but have you noticed the word contagious is in there? A bit controversial. It went in there just before the pandemic. Thought, should we take it out now? Let's leave it in. Let's take a look at it. Wildfire, expressing outwardly the work that God has done inwardly. Our faith and love will not be contained. Side point here. It's not cannot, because it can be, but it will not. So choice, it will not be contained. And then get this, we have a contagious passion for Jesus that is raw, real, and unapologetic. There is something about contagiousness. It's actually something that is essential for the mission of the gospel, for the extension of the church. And I even want to argue that we need to get to a place where if there were three words that would define us, we'd want contagious to be one of them. We'd want to move intentionally to be a place that actually we are the kind of people that change rooms, change environments, change families, change cities, change nations, that we get ourselves in trouble. Because you know what? If you're contagious, you're going to be a troublemaker. There's something about contagious. Do you know what it actually means? It means something that is passed on by touch or contact. Contagious means something that of God that is in us, that is Passed on, not by hopeful thinking, not even just by prayer, but literally connecting, touching the lives of the world around us, connecting with one another. When I think about the mission of contagiousness, Jesus was the ultimate, right? Leaving heaven itself in order to touch the world. Leaving heaven itself to connect in the most, all the different kind of circumstances you can imagine and start a pandemic. 2,000 years ago, and we're going to talk about how we continue that today. You see, being contagious, I think, is actually part of the mission of being a Christian. In fact, I believe the mission of a Christian is to be intentionally uh, contagious. And actually, if we don't have this drive within us, we're going to come to church, we're going to get our fill, we're going to be encouraged, we're going to, you know, fill up as Christians. But actually, if we don't have a plan to then go and take this out, the whole point of uncontainable is not just about what happens in the 15, 20 minutes of worship on a Sunday. In fact, like G said yesterday, last week, it's about that should be the overflow of what's happening in our weeks. But not only that, it should be the stirring to then get out. Have you got a plan this week to be contagious in the city of Hereford, in Charleston, in Raleigh, in East Africa, Cape Town. Have we got that as part of our plan? Are you ready to kind of get a little bit more infected today with the kingdom of God, with the goodness of God, with the fire of God, with the passion of God, with the grace of God, and take it out intentionally? Because here's the deal. That's what Jesus sent us out to do. Look at it, Matthew 28. Look at this, Matthew 28. Therefore, go and infect the world. Be contagious. Go and make disciples of all nations, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus' mission for us as Christians was not just to get your breakthrough, was not just to get our healing, was not just to get our forgiveness, was not just to get our portion of grace. That's the starting point. The end point is you go and share it with every person you possibly can. We are on a mission to double as a church in the next few years. And so, you know, do you know what? I could have got up and talked a little bit more about worship in the setting of church. But I believe that as we finish up Uncontainable, God is saying, I'm lifting the lid, church. This wildfire passion is actually about what we do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then it's a peak on Sunday. It's fruit on Sunday. It's celebration on Sunday. There's something about being uncontainable. We've got to go after being contagious. And do you know what? This isn't just for the extroverts. This isn't just for the evangelists. It isn't just for the pastors. It isn't just for those of us who maybe find some of what we think contagiousness is a little bit easier, but it's for all of us. Every single one of us in the subtle to the significant. Look at this in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. 
says you, all of you, all of us, every fire starts, every location from the youngest to the oldest, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare, that you may be contagious, that you may go, that you may be consumed with the cause of the kingdom. Declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and in to his wonderful light. There's something about living a wildfire life that is more about the people outside of you than what's going on inside of you. One of the things I love about being back at kind of the grassroots of church planting right now in Charleston is that it's every single day. It's every single day. Here's the reality for us. If we don't get out this week, no one's coming to church. And more importantly than that, more importantly than that, it's not about attendance. If we're not out with with a contagious mindset, then who through us is going to have the opportunity of meeting Jesus, receiving grace, receiving encouragement, receiving support. There's something about becoming contagious that is actually about becoming captivated with the winds of others in our lives. But the problem is, is religion wants to quash it, wants to quash our contagiousness. In fact, if we think about it, religion was the first social distancer. You sit there, you sit there. You come in this time, you come in that time. You see, religion locked people down. It locked the gospel down. Put it into systems, put it into, you know, structures that locked it down and said, be quiet in this time. Be quiet. You can can maybe think about speaking if you've done enough here. Religion sanitized the passion and the wildness of the Holy Spirit. It sanitized it because it wasn't safe. And God is calling his church to rise up with contagious passion. And here's here's the word for you today. He's calling us to rise up and create a pandemic of praise. God is calling us to bring a pandemic of praise to this generation, to our cities, to our nations, to our world. A pandemic of praise. That if we would live, not just in these moments, but Monday, Tuesday, Friday night, with such a wildfire, there's going to be something of his kingdom move across the world. You see, it is the mission of a Christian to be intentionally contagious. It's part of the mission of the gospel. It's here to break down the walls of religion. Break it down and be uncontainable in our praise. It was really interesting because as I was preparing this message, it wasn't the DNA that got me thinking about being contagious. And honestly, that word, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't overly noticed it in our DNA until I was reading through Luke chapter one. Now, Luke chapter one, it's one of the four gospels. If you're new to church, there are four eyewitness accounts of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They start the New Testament, and then we go through to the early church after that. And this year, I've been reading one gospel, and then a letter from the New Testament, one gospel, and then a letter from the New Testament. As I sat down to prepare for this message, I was in Luke chapter 1. And Luke chapter 1 is a part of the Bible I've read, I don't know how many times. And there's been, every now and again, a powerful moment or a revelation from it. But honestly, it's one of the chapters that I've kind of read and moved on from. Because it's not one that I necessarily completely saw some of the profound realities in it. But as I was reading through, one thing struck me about Luke chapter 1. Because in the Old Testament, there's loads of songs. They, you know, In fact, there's a whole book, Psalms, dedicated to songs and poems and declarations. Even Song of Solomon, it's all this, 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 this expression. But actually, there's not a lot of songs in the New Testament. But there are two in Luke chapter 1. There are two moments of uncontainable worship and wildfire in Luke chapter 1. One song is written by Mary, probably the most famous woman in the whole world, the mother of Jesus. And one is written by a man called Zachariah, both experiencing something quite profound in that moment. We're going to jump into it. Bit of context. We've got a couple called Zachariah and Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth is the descendant of some significant religious leaders of her nation and of her country. She had significant standing. And she's married to Zechariah, who's one of the head priests. 
Now, it might not be your goal to be a head priest in life today, but back then, this was like a rival point. These guys were, to some extent, at the peak of what it would be within their society, within their, their culture, within their family lines, but they have a significant and deep challenge, and it's that they can't have children. And for them, there was two sides to why this was painful. One, the reality that they probably wanted children and wanted to start a family. But actually, the other side of it was that in the culture of the day, that would have been a huge disgrace. And we obviously don't necessarily agree with that and have that viewpoint now, but back then it was huge. And particularly for that to be the key religious leaders. There was, would have been a question about, well, what have they done? What is going on behind the scenes? Surely this is punishment for God. This would have, for Elizabeth, been crippling, been life-defining. And actually, by the point we meet her in Luke chapter 1, she's gone beyond the ability to conceive. But something happens. Zechariah is performing this religious ceremony in the temple. Ultimately, this is kind of like the peak pinnacle of his, you know, religious practice career, if we can think of it like that. And God shows up. And what happens is actually an angel comes and speaks to Zechariah and says to him, you're going to have a child. And not only are you going to have a child, but this child is going to be a child of significance. They're going to be a delight to you. Isn't it wonderful that God even includes that? It's going to be a delight to you. But also this child is going to go before and make a way for salvation. There's going to be no one like him before and no one like him after. This is huge. Zachariah, as I'm sure I would, doubts. And he's like, what? How? But God says, and he basically silences him, and Zachariah ends up muted, and he can't speak. Comes out of the temple, he can't say anything. People have thought he'd, you know, whatever had happened. But then, this is where we pick it up in Luke chapter 1. Let's pick this up here. After this, he goes home after this kind of whole event in the temple, and his wife, Elizabeth, becomes pregnant. And for five months remains in seclusion. She says, this, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he's shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Now, it's easy to kind of read that very normally that we are on a Sunday morning, Sunday evening, whether you're gathering right now. But think about this. Just think about this. This is like the worst thing that was going on for Elizabeth. The worst thing. And God turns it round in an instant. Turns it round in a second. This declaration is one of thankfulness and gratitude, but it's also one of relief. Deep, deep relief. But I want to draw our attention to this. She ends up in seclusion. It's interesting, you know, there's lots of different theories for why she ends up in seclusion. Some people think perhaps she was trying to protect the pregnancy. Other people think because Zechariah at the time couldn't speak, couldn't explain it. They were almost just kind of keeping it between the two of them. Other people question whether, you know, for Elizabeth, people would have questioned why and how she got pregnant. After all, they've not been able to get pregnant all this time. So she's ultimately in hiding and she's in seclusion. And again, we don't know whether they've told the world, but I think to some extent we can assume that it's more likely that they haven't. And so here we have this monumental breakthrough, this unbelievable miracle, and yet they're isolated and they're on their own. Now, over these next five or six months, something else happens, and an angel visits somebody else, and her name is Mary. Now, Mary's at a completely different stage of life. One, she's from way more humble background. She's not even married, and she's not marrying some great religious leader. She's about to marry a carpenter. Now, listen, guys, that's no shot at anybody in the trades. Skilled guys, love it. I wish I had your skills. But culturally back then, it's the total other end of the spectrum. And an angel comes to Mary and says, you are highly favored. You're not only, you're going to get pregnant, but not only pregnant, you're going to get pregnant with the son of God, the savior of the world. Mary has questions, but she doesn't doubt. She gets pregnant and then this happens. Let's pick this up again. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Just pause for a second. Because we know the end of the story, we can assume that Mary's singular emotion and feeling was one of excitement and, you know, wow, this is incredible. I've got this saved. But actually, go way back and actually think about what Mary might have really been thinking. 
She's just got pregnant miraculously out of wedlock in a culture that that event could actually cost her life. So when the Bible says that she got ready and hurried, this isn't like, oh, going to see my cousin. <laughs> There's actually an argument here to say, she's like, what's going on? What the heck is going on? I've just had an angel turn up and I'm now pregnant. I'm not even ready to get married. Is my future husband going to believe me? And there's even an argument to say that, you know, she probably, because Elizabeth was her cousin, she's thinking, I need some help. Maybe even I need some protection. Maybe I need some wisdom. But for whatever reason, she hurries to Zachariah's home and greets Elizabeth. And again, we don't know whether Elizabeth knew that Mary was pregnant or Mary knew that Elizabeth was pregnant. Right? At the end of the day, it says she hurried. She got ready and hurried. That to me says she didn't have time to send a text or they didn't have phones in that day. Right? It says that actually, and this is really important for this moment that we're about to read on here. It says this, and when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Just think about this. Jesus was a fetus. Right? It's not, you know, this is like, there's something responding. John the Baptist, the baby in the womb. And then Elizabeth gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? When they come into contact. There's something in this moment. There's something in this moment. There's a contagious thing happening here. And do you know what? The fullness of the celebration couldn't be had in isolation. But something happens when they connect. And in a loud voice. Remember, Elizabeth, she was a religious wife's, you know, religious leader's wife, proper to do. You know, she welcomed, said, well, welcome, Mary. Pregnant with the Lord of all. No, in a loud voice, in a wildfire voice, in an uncontainable voice, in a moment where things are starting to click, where it's starting to go, oh my goodness, maybe, just maybe I can see what God's doing. Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord, the mother of my Lord. You see, what is Elizabeth getting excited about here? It's not about pregnancy. It's about salvation. Elizabeth is getting excited because she knows that her baby is going to make a way for this baby and that baby is going to save the world. This isn't even about the personal blessing. This is about the generational nation transformation. This is about beyond them. They're getting excited about something beyond them. Beyond them. It's powerful. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. In this moment, there's a kinetic contagiousness. There's something happening as they share together. In isolation, Elizabeth didn't get it all. In isolation, Mary didn't get it all. But when they came together, something of the Holy Spirit breaks out. And then Mary, we don't know if she could sing. We don't know. She might have had a terrible voice. Right? This isn't about a musician. This isn't about what happens next. She just starts singing. She just starts singing. Have we got that? It goes into Luke uh, 1, 39 to 45. Let's jump to that if we've got it. Here we go. Mary says, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He's been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. She goes on and she praises him and praises him and praises him. Because something contagious There's a move, there's a contagious, kinetic move of the power of God. They didn't plan for it. They didn't know, but God has included this in his word for us to be captivated, to be intentional, of testifying with the things, the miracles of God that we're pregnant with, the miracles of God that are just in those early stages, the miracles of God to share together and wildfire breaks out. The question, therefore, is, is how contagious are you? How contagious are you and I? Mary and Elizabeth, their their lives were wrapped up almost beyond their control. But we read their stories so that in our day, we can be intentional. 
We can be purposeful to live contagious lives that scream of the goodness of God and make changes in the world around us. How contagious are you? Are you the kind of person that changes a room? And then the second question is, are you the kind of person that changes a room for good? (laughs) What are people catching? What are people catching when they're around you? Are they catching an excitement and a willingness, a submission and a being captivated and consumed in the work of God that ignites something within them, that ignites something within them right at the point of conception even? Way before Jesus has come, lived, done miracles, taught, gone to the cross, risen again, even in this moment, this contagious praise, this contagious passion for Jesus, the mother of my Lord, breaks out. And they start, at the end of Luke chapter 1, this pandemic of praise. Because what happens then is John the Baptist, the baby, is born, and Zechariah ends up uh, you know, being able to speak again. And what's the first thing he does after he can speak is he sings. He writes another song. For all we knew, it might have sounded like a cat being strangled. But there was something of contagious praise. Contagious praise. Are we the kind of people that have a bit of contagious praise on Monday because we've been charged up on Sunday, but by Tuesday, it's run out? Are we the kind of people that are contagious when other people around us are contagious? Or actually, are we the ones bringing it to the table? There's something about this wildfire DNA that is about being intentional and saying, I'm going to bring it to the party. I'm going to bring it to college. I'm going to bring it to work. I'm going to bring it to that cafe. I'm going to bring it to that bar. I'm going to bring it to that football team, that rugby team. I'm going to bring it here. going to bring it there. going to bring it in the high times, in the low times, because I want to be contagious. If somebody was going to use three words to describe me, I want to be contagious. And I know it's going to get me in trouble sometimes. I know some people are not going to want it, but I'm going to be contagious. I'm contagious with the things of the kingdom, driven and making a difference in the world around us. So how do we, how do we become contagious? Should we talk about that? Because we all know how to catch COVID, but how do we catch a kingdom, a kingdom, contag- you know, how do we catch it? Well, the first thing is we've actually got to do that. We've got to catch it. You've got to catch it, right? You're never going to have it and be able to pass it on if you don't catch it. You know, one of the things when we became parents, you know, first couple of years, I remember Saz uh, coming back and saying, oh, so-and-so's kid's got chicken pox. And we had this really strange conversation. It's like, should we take Eden? Yeah. Rub her against that, like, child's face. Why? Because you wanted to catch it. So she gets this immunity. Are you catching it? Are you putting yourself in a place where you're catching something of the kingdom? You know, when you get the option to be around a a setting like streams or groups or a worship night, can you take it or leave it or do you want to get there and catch something? Can you take it or leave it or you're like, even if there's just one thing, I want to catch it. I want to catch it. You know, what about the people that irritate you? Do you avoid them or do you want to go and catch something off them? And they might need to evolve the way that they share those things in their life. There might be some legitimate reasons that irritate you. But are you putting yourself in a position to catch it? Or, just like through COVID, are you self-isolating? Are you keeping some social distance with the power of the gospel? Are you staying quiet when actually the amen might help you catch it? Where the agreement might help you catch it? Why do we say amen? It says, I agree. Amen means let it be. The reason that we have cultivated a culture of response and the reason why there's a few people here saying amen or come on is because I want to catch that. I want to catch that. Amen. I want to catch that. Amen. I want to catch that. Hey, do you know what, guys? I'll be honest. It's so easy within, um, you know, a thriving church community to just become used to it. Oh, we've had another salvation in Worcester. Great. You know, we've had another salvation. Oh, fantastic. Well, I want to be around it. I want to catch it. Did you hear about those? Have you seen them? They're totally different. There was somebody here last week. We were, I had the privilege of being involved in the worship. And there was somebody um, at the back absolutely raving, going for it. And I thought, I want to catch it. I want to go, I want to go and hear what the heck has gone on in their life. Because when we left, they weren't like that. I want to, I want to catch it. Who are you rubbing up alongside in order to catch what they've got? Because you can't be contagious if you haven't got it. 
You can't just catch a theory of Jesus. You can't just catch a theory of him. This is what religious, religion does. We will, you know, religion will teach us to learn about Jesus rather than to completely, truly connect with him. Have you got a plan to catch it? What about the next opportunity for a mission trip somewhere in the world? I know in Freedom Raleigh, they're going over to, I believe, Cape Town next year. And do you know what? The sign-up is huge. The sign-up's huge. There's a hunger. There's like, I, I want to go see what God's doing. I, I want to go and give, and I'm sure that there is something. I want to go and serve, and I want to go and help. But I want to go catch it. I want to go catch it. I want to go catch something of it. When we have that hunger to catch, it's going to inevitably make us more contagious. Secondly, this is a long sentence, but I'm going to break this down. Go with me on this. I think that often we're going to struggle to be contagiously passionate and uncontainable when the things of God are a part-time side hustle rather than the center of our focus, lives, and priority. When we're doing the Jesus thing on the weekend... We're not going to be contagious. When, you know, the only time we pray is a Sunday. When the only time we worship is a Sunday. When the only time we get in God's word is a Sunday. We're not going to be contagious. Because we're getting around something rather than getting something in us. And I'm not talking about every single person working for the church or becoming a pastor. There is a bigger, bigger picture going on here. But is God's kingdom, his gospel, and the extension of that through the local church the center of your focus? Is that why you're trying to drive the profit margins in your business? Is that why you're trying to drive the profit margins in your business? Because I tell you right now, we need more resource in the kingdom and in the church. God may have anointed you, may have called you into business, but is the kingdom the center of that focus? Is the gospel, do you want to see salvation as a result of what you sow financially? Perhaps God's called you to a key kingdom cause, justice, righteousness. But is the local church part of the center of your focus? Because we can get distracted. There's something about being contagious. If it's a side hustle, we're never going to have anything to share. But when you're consumed, when there's something of God at the center of who we are, it's going to come out in the coffees. It's going to come out in, around the dinner table. It's going to come out in our families and with our children. It's going to come out in the car journeys. It's going to come out in the commute. It's going to come out in the WhatsApp messages to the group. It's going to come out in those moments. We have to make God's kingdom the center of our focus, our life, and our priorities. One of the things that Mary did, as opposed to Zachariah, she just said, let it be. Use me however you want. Take the whole of my life. Something powerful, even that in this moment with Mary and Elizabeth, they're pregnant. There's nothing more intimate. There's nothing more that you can carry within yourself than that kind of concept. And that's what God is calling us to do when it comes to the things of God. Another way that we remain contagious is we stay grateful for where we've come from. If you go read Luke chapter 1, both Mary and Elizabeth and even Zachariah all speak about how great it is that God has brought them from where they were. Elizabeth, he's taken my disgrace away. Mary, he's thought about me in my humble beginnings. Zachariah, that Lord has blessed me. It's so easy to become distanced to the reality and the power and the profoundness of our salvation. And do you know what? Here's the thing. Things become less contagious with time don't they? And so that, that contagiousness when we first knew Christ, it lessens over time. Especially when, you know, we have a bit of challenge in church. Maybe we have a bit of a breakdown in a relationship. Maybe we pray and that thing doesn't happen. It goes back down. But actually God is saying that we as the church need to become more contagious with time. More contagious with time. Why? Because over time, we see more of God's goodness. We know more of God's grace. We know more of God's truth. We know more of God's provision. And here's the thing, not just in the good days, not just when it's about us. There are times where we've got to celebrate somebody else's breakthrough, even when we've seen our breakthrough take two steps back. There's something about gratitude that fuels contagiousness. Because if you are grateful for something, surely you're going to want to share it. Surely you're going to want to share it. Coming back here to visit family and friends, it's fascinating what family and friends want to show us. 
oh, come and see this. Come and see. Have you seen that? Have you seen? They want to share that which they are grateful for and that which they're excited about. We've got to have an intentional plan to become more contagious over time and share and share and share and share. And do you know what, guys? I get it. Perhaps there's some of us, we're feeling a bit dry right now. Perhaps we're feeling like that part of our faith is, is a bit of a desert. I get it. One of the things I'm so grateful for, being back in kind of grassroots church planting, is it's connecting me again with my salvation. It's connected me again. It's like, you know, I met, Saz and I had a conversation um, recently, and we just asked ourselves a very simple question. We weren't doubting anything. We weren't having a bad day. We just said, why are we here? Why, why, why are we here? Oh, to plant Freedom Church Charleston. Yeah, great. But why? Because I want somebody to find salvation like I did at 16. I want somebody to experience breakthrough from religion like I did at 24. I want somebody to experience the transformation of their marriage like we did in 2008. I want somebody to break out of religious lies like I did in 2010. I want somebody to be able to walk away from that life-defining temptation. That's why I'm here. Right, get out the door. Get out the door. Get out the door. Where are we going? Right, is there a God encounter in this Starbucks? Is there a God encounter on the beach? Is there a God encounter at the pool? Is there a God encounter at the school play yard? Is there a God encounter in these moments? Because when I'm grateful, I want to share it. And here's the challenge. If we're not contagious, then probably it says something about how we feel about what God has done for us. If there isn't that driving factor to want to share, then maybe it says something about how we feel about what God has done for us. But as we wrap up, ultimately one of the ways that we'll be contagious is we've actually got to connect. We've actually got to be in touch with people. Remember, contagious things are only passed on by touch or connection. Some of us, even as we've come through the season of COVID, we're still isolated. We're still in our bubbles. We're still trying to break out of the rhythms of those things. But actually, one of the ways that you can be intentionally contagious is connect. And firstly, connecting with one another inside the house of God. Connecting and talking over coffees and drinks and walks about the goodness of God, the things we're struggling with, the things we're wrestling with, but connecting together in those moments. But actually, outside the walls of our churches, who are we connecting to? And who are we connecting to outside of just circumstance? Sure, you're in your workplace, but are you and I there intentionally? Wanting to be contagious, wanting to connect. Do we have names on our list of the people that we are reaching out to? Or is connection just perhaps at times too much for us? We're too busy. We're living lots of other things. But there's something about when you're contagious, when you want to share it, you'll pick connection over comfort. Connection over comfort. There's something that God is calling us to as a church to bring a pandemic of praise. See, being intentionally contagious means you put moments of connection above moments of comfort. You know, I was chatting even with Pastor G and H and they recently went on a holiday. And, you know, this this is a big needed holiday, a needed break. It's been a busy season. And yet, what's the story they're telling us about? Oh, we've got a chance to minister to this person. Aren't you on holiday? Not from this. Aren't you taking a break? Not from being contagious. Haven't you prayed for enough people? Not if there's another chance. Haven't you seen enough? No, not if this could actually change. There's something about connecting and being intentionally contagious that we don't switch off from. And here we go, guys. You've heard us talk about it. There's balance. There's time to stop. There's time to rest. And in fact, so often we need to do that more than we do. But I'm asking us right now, who are we ready to share this wildfire passion with this week? Those words of encouragement, those words of hope, those words of testimony. What if our contagious passion, like Elizabeth and Mary's, could actually change history? What if our contagious passion could change cities? and nations, and generations. Guys, so often and too often, particularly in some of our nations and some of our regions, we look at the church dwindling 
and falling back in general. And yet we have more in our hands than these two women did. We have more testimony. We have more resource. We have more, even more knowledge. We've, we've got the story of Jesus. We've got the New Testament. We've got the beginning of the church. And yet we're doubting more than they did. Two pregnant women, one potentially in life-threatening trouble, are there in a hill country, a country city in Judea going, the Savior of the Lord is here. All salvation of mankind is here between these two wombs. Blessed is the woman. How lucky are we? And yet we're the other side of it. They still had a maybe. We've got a certainty. We know it happened. They didn't. We know it's finished. They didn't. That's why we can have a contagious passion. Because we, we worship from a place of it's done. It's written. It's finished. So as we wrap up this series, church, I've got one question and one call to us. Let's not just do wildfire. Let's be wildfire. Let's be it in our communities. Let's be it when we gather. Let's be the people that bring the praise report, that bring the passion, even when there's two of us, three of us, four of us, five of us, let alone the hundreds that will come. And I tell you, it's coming in the name of Jesus. But the reality is we gotta be wildfire, church. God is calling us freedom to create a pandemic of praise. He's calling us to be those that are seen in our car, raving to worship music by our friends, and they say, what on earth was happening? You must have had good news. Said, no, I had terrible news. But I was celebrating that Jesus is Lord through it all. And our places of work where it's all going bad, but you've got a smile on your face because you know that your life is not defined by your paycheck, by your career, by your success. We can change the world, church. We can change the world because he's already done it. We just have to be intentionally um, contagious and courageous in how we share it. Church, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that in this moment thousands of years ago, you showed yourself true with the immeasurable power and miraculous truth that you can do all things, that you can change the life of those struggling, that you can change the life of those who feel insignificant and change the world and history itself. Today, God, I pray around our church in every location for an impartation of that contagious praise contagious wildfire right now Lord that even in the darkest and most confusing seasons of our life we will choose to declare that we will be and live a life of wildfire Father that in the times of breakthrough we won't forget that it was you that broke through that it won't be a few days before we thank you for the miracles that we've been praying for Lord today transform us to be like Mary and Elizabeth consumed caught up, surrendered to one thing and one thing alone, your purpose and your kingdom coming on earth in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Church around the world, it's been great to join you. Let's go and be contagious this week, people. Go and change your world. Change the people around you through living this wildfire out. Be raw, be real, be unapologetic. Choose to not contain it. Share something in that moment you shouldn't. Share a testimony when you're not allowed to. Go for it. Be uncontainable. There's something that God is calling us to freedom. This pandemic of praise to see the gospel move all over the nations. And hand over to our local leaders where you are. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been great to have you with us.